Learning occurs in many ways, reading, writing, observing, and doing. Montgomery College's access to history is for the doers. Our guests have participated in actions or events that we now recognize as part of history. In the studio, they sit down, mic up, and have conversations with faculty and students from Montgomery College. There is no host, no flashy set, and no commercials, just people and their stories. Sometimes the stories date back many years, and sometimes the story is current. It's all historical, and it's part of Montgomery College's access to history. My name is Dimitri Paris. I was a tank platoon leader in World War II. Had five tanks and 24 men in my platoon. We were in the Battle of the Bulge. We captured a bridge at Remagen and fought across Germany and later in Czechoslovakia. I am 97 years old and this is my story. Okay, why don't you start off by telling us how you joined the service? Well, I was living in Leavenworth, Kansas at the time. And on, Mar on December 7th, 1941, when uh, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, I went down to the draft board to enlist and, and learned I had a deferment, which I hadn't known about. I was working for the VA facility just outside of Leavenworth. And uh, there's a large facility, two hospitals and an old soldier's home. I went to the manager and, and asked him to lift the deferment, and he said, you know four or five jobs and we're going to need help, so I'm going to... So then I contacted an officer that my family knew at Fort Leavenworth as a command general staff college and asked him if he could help me, and, and this was December, and uh, in April I got word from the draft board that they'd lifted my divert. The Americans were against all war at the time. We were very isolationist. But Roosevelt got through two things. One was the, the Lend-Lease program to help other nations with equipment. And the other was a draft law. And the draft law, when your number came up, you had to go in to serve. So that's what the draft law was. And, and uh, the, the local draft board called me. The secretary, name was Joe Horry, said they lifted your deferment so you can enlist. So I, I enlisted at Fort Leavenworth. This was in April, 1942. Okay, and why did you want to enlist? Well, Japan had attacked us and Germany and Italy had declared war against us. I just figured that we should and, uh, and uh, it was something to do. Our country was in danger. And in the years later, we learned that, it, that was Hitler's final goal after he conquered Europe and he was bombing England. His next goal would be America. So. I, we didn't think think of it at that time, but it was just, I thought it was just a thing to do. So, can you describe some of your training at Fort Knox? Yes, I had, I took a couple of tests at uh, Fort Leavenworth before I got my deferment, Jay, before I entered the service, and scored rather highly on them. So, I got to, to, to more or less choose what branch I'd like to be in. We didn't have an armor branch at that time but I could see it in the future, and I didn't want to be an infantryman. So uh, they, uh, they sent me to Fort Knox, Kentucky, which was the, later to be the Armor Center. And we had the usual 13 weeks of basic training, and that's marching, map reading, and firing a rifle, and shooting the tank guns, and all the stuff you get there. And uh, so that was a good basic training, and, and uh, then, they, by then, they changed from mechanized force to armed forces, so it became. And I, I then went from there to Officer Candidate School at Fort Knox, Kentucky. And about half the students there flunked out. It was a very tough school, but I made it and and was commissioned in the cavalry. We commissioned half of them in infantry and half cavalry, but that suited me fine because then I knew by what my destination would be, would be the new armor branch rather than infantry. So did you choose the armor branch or they assigned you to the armor branch? Well, you don't, ch you just hope, you, you, you let them know what you want, but you don't make the decision. Okay. The army makes the decision. 
And then what did you do in Southern California? Well, I re first, let's go back a bit. Okay. From there, I, my first assignment after being commissioned a second lieutenant was to the 9th Mechanized Division in Fort Riley, Kansas. And that was established out of the cavalry, the 2nd Cavalry Regiment. They took away their horses and said, you're now armor and you become 9th Armored Division. And they, we trained at Fort Riley. Then they sent us to the California Desert, which had been established by Patton. And it was tough training in the Desert Training Center. You learned to maneuver, to fire, and to, and you were limited in, in a lot of ways. Very hot out there, 125 degrees every day. And Why California? Because there's vast areas and sub, it's desert, desert country out there, the desert country along the Mexican border. It was, they just, it was a lot of land there they could take over and make, make into training camps for soldiers. Well, why would they prepare you for the desert if you're going to Germany? They didn't know where you'd go at the time, but the fact is, it was a lot of maneuver area. You could run tanks all over the area. That was why they picked it. Uh, not because you were going to fight in the desert, because they didn't know where you were going to fight. You might be in the Pacific, for that matter. Right. It was just it was a lot of a good training ground where you could do a lot of firing without disturbing local people and and uh, a lot of maneuvers and tactical exercises over this vast desert training center. It's Death Valley, is what it is. People call it Death mm -hmm. Valley. It's a desert area. So where did you go after Death Valley? From there, our division, uh, in the means, was sent to uh, to Camp Hope, Louisiana, for maneuvers. So we were new, we were getting ready for going overseas, and they reorganized the whole armor division. The first ones were established in favor of the infantry with fixed regiments. So they did away with that and, and established a division with three combat commands. So we went to Camp Pope, Louisiana, which has a lot of swampy, lousy weather, wet and rainy and all. And from there we did a lot of maneuvers and did firing tests and other tests that maneuver to qualify to go overseas. And that's that was really the, the, the step uh, to prepare you for overseas. And that's where we got our orders to go. And uh, we left them. Camp Polk and so sailed out of New York then. To go across the Atlantic? Yeah. We, we were on the Queen Mary. They put the whole division on one ship, along with a lot of wax, along with nurses, some British girls from the West Indies, British West Indies. And it was a foot ship load, but it was a fast trip. And, uh, uh, to, and they took us across uh, the Atlantic and we took us into Scotland, and from there we went down to England. Were you concerned uh, about submarine attacks or the possibility of attack on the way over? Of course, we lost a lot of merchant ships, a lot of them were sunk, and of course the Queen Mary was fast, and I was designated as a military police while on the ship, so I had full access, and I went to go back, and, and they, would, they would change their course every Few minutes, and that was because they knew how long it took a, a German submarine to fire a missile, lay in on them, and, and fire a missile. Uh, and so they would zigzag back and forth. And we had some, might have had some destroyers. I couldn't see any of those, but mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, to avoid. And, and I think that's why they, they then ship went further up and landed in Scotland rather than England itself. Well, we were from, there we went down to England. Set up in barracks, and that's where we do our equipment after we got to England. Mm -hmm. Our tanks and half tracks and, and artillery pieces. We do all our equipment there. So, could you talk about a little bit about what that equipment was? Well, of course, the tank battalions do their tanks there, and uh, each company, each uh, in the battalion, there's uh, four companies. Each company had three platoons. Each platoon had five tanks. So. So in a tank company, you had three platoons, five each, that's 15 tanks, and the company commander had a tank, and the maintenance crew, your mechanics, had one with a bulldozer blade on it. So you had 17 tanks, but generally it was only 15 of them in the battle. The other two were not used. And then you had the other companies, and you also had with you armored infantry, which meant they were infantry mounted in half tracks. They weren't marching infantry. They weren't ground soldiers. So they could keep up with us. What is the half track? 
It's a vehicle, open, open type vehicle like a, a motor car, except it's open top and it has tracks on the back and wheels in the front. So it's maneuver across country with a track called a half track vehicle. And they were made, most of them had white engines, 150 horsepower engine. And then our artillery was, was not drawn by horses or trucks. It was mounted on tank chassis that took the chassis, took the top off the turret off the, and mounted the, the 105 millimeter cannons on that so they could keep up with us. Oh. And it was, it was, it was taking the old cavalry, draw your saber and charge spirit to the full degree so that they could be right with us when we were. So what was it like being inside of a tank? Can you talk a little bit about that? You know, how you it's, operated with the crew? It's very tight. It's very close. Uh, you got down in the lower parts, you have the driver down here and, the, and the, what we call the bow gunner or assistant driver. And they have periscopes so when they were closed down, but you couldn't see through them really, they were not of value. Up above you had the tank commander who was always exposed from the waist up so he could observe. And you had a, a gunner beside him who operated the, the main cannon, the 75 millimeter cannon. And you had a loader who was crouched down there and he would load the yeah, load the, the weapon. Uh, most of the time, the crew was all buttoned up. They said their hatches were closed, so they were so. And you had a, a your system. You had a this PA system. You could talk to all the crew all the time. And so when when you'd see a target, why well, you you had a fixed command you'd give, which alerted the gunner, told him where it was, and your turret, which circled all the way around. You could lay it, you could say, near the corner of that white house up there, and you could lay it on there. And then you, the second command told the loader what ammunition, because we had several kinds. We had high explosive ammunition used against ground troops or buildings, uh, armor piercing to use against emplacements or tanks or concrete. Thing. And you had smoke ammunition, which would lay a smoke stream. So you'd tell him what, and he'd load the gun. Uh, and then after he laid on the target, then you give him the range to the gun, say 2,000 yards or, or 1, 500 yards. And Were you estimating the range? They gave you techniques to, to do that? had to estimate the range. That was my poorest subject, too. <laughs> I cheated on the final test. And my buddy, I said, what have you been doing? He said, I've been setting up the test for the range estimations. And so he gave me all the destinations that were going to be on the test. And I t told my crew, I didn't tell them the exact that's the exact range because they didn't want to find out we were cheating. So we knew what the ranges were and we passed the test with flying colors. And, wow. But so, uh, inside, and the gun is there, the, 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 the breech where you load is big. It, and when it fires, it comes back like this. The whole tank, 32 tons, jumps back and forth. So if that were to hit you, it would break your arm or your ribs or anything. So you have to watch for it because the gunner would signal signal when he was ready to fire, ready or fire, he'd say, or on the way. And he hit a little solenoid electrical switch would set it off and the whole tank would then jerk back and forth. Wow. And everybody would grab their something while it fired, when the tank fired. But also in addition to my tank communication, I could communicate by radio with my other four tanks uh, to the tank commanders there had radios. I could communicate with my company commander I could even call my battalion up at the next higher level. So I had good good communi radio co communications. During combat, what were some of the techniques you used, like relaying and radio, stuff like that? How did the relaying work? Uh, sometimes you, like I'd want to call Colonel, whose call sign was uh, Gopher. He was from Minnesota, mine was Squirrel. Hello, Gopher, this is Squirrel, over. Nothing happened. Might try it two or three more times. Somebody would cut in and say, Gopher's answering you, I shall relay. That was somebody in between who could hear me call and hear him, but it wasn't reaching me. And so I would then send a message and he'd relay it to the colonel, and the colonel would relay it back to me. Was that because of distance? You were too far to hear? Yeah, we had FM radios. It was distance and, and topography. Hilly country might, or might, might be just the distance was too far. That was what we, and if you heard somebody call several times and you could hear the answer, and you knew he couldn't, so you'd cut in. It didn't matter who it was or who, who, who 
you would just relay the messages for him. And the time they told me to go up and look at the Rhine, I had my crew set up to, if, uh, if I couldn't reach it, they were to relay or get on a high hill. And, and if my tank ran out of gas, I'd take another tank and, and they were to stay there and relay it. What were the, uh, how did they build the tanks and how did the method that they used to build those tanks change and affect your strategies? Well, we had nothing at the, when we got into the war. We, we'd gone into a peacetime strategy and ignored everything. And, and so they were caught with their, flatly without much preparation. But they began building them different, had several different plants. And they started out with small ones and they weren't very good. The ones we sent to Africa early in the war was what we call the M3, and it was, it was a terrible tank. It had the main gun down low. It only had a traverse of 17 degrees. So if you're looking around, you see an enemy target over here, you couldn't reach. You had to turn the whole tank around to get the gun. In later editions, they put the gun up on the turret right below the commander. So that when he could, he could move the gun around, he was moving. And alongside of that was a machine gun actual machine gun so that he could if it was M3 he could fire the machine gun or the big gun. Well, what were the difference between the riveted tanks and the welded tanks? Oh well, the first one had rivets on them and when you get hit by an anti-tank round those rivets would shear off and go around inside like a steel ball like shrapnel and wound your men and, and seriously wound them. So that it, then they began to weld the tanks rather than use use that so we had, to, we had to lose men before they'd learned their lesson, uh, or just learned the lesson to, to correct it. Were you a, did you ever operate in a riveted tank? Only in training. In training at Fort Knox, we, we learned how to drive and operate them, fired them on the right. But overseas, when we drew our tanks in England, we got the latest model of the M4, which was called the M4A3 Easy 8 which the public calls a Sherman. And uh, we got the, and it has 76 millimeter gun, which is a little better gun. Not as good as a German gun, but a little better. So, uh, so we, didn't, we didn't have any of the riveted tanks in service. But some of the divisions got over earlier may have. What kind of engines did those use? They tried everything in the world. and. Uh, the best ones we had over there were the Ford engines for those tanks. And the light tanks was a twin Cadillac engine, which was a beauty. They worked fine. But they had diesel engines. They had Chrysler. They had one design, Chrysler mobile, five Chrysler engines in a circle. But if one of them would go out, you, you had to, it was like a car with a dead engine. You, you couldn't use the other ones. And so they, they experimented an awful lot. Uh, our, our, our Army Ardeners aren't the smartest guys in the world. They, they, I have not much respect for Army Ardeners. But they, you had to show them in, in, in the field or in combat where they made their mistake. Not, they just didn't think through to the ultimate. I'll tell you another thing. There was a guy named Christie who designed automobiles. And he was way ahead of them. And, but he couldn't get along with Ardeners and they didn't like him. Because the ordinance operates on the theory that if we don't think of it, it's not good. And he, he's a fellow who had built one tank, and he drove it from Fort Meade, Maryland. You know where that is? Mm -hmm. Fort Meade to Hagerstown, Maryland, on the tracks, took off the tracks, and brought it back on the highway. So it could be a versatile uh, vehicle, cross-country or on the roads. He developed a, a suspension system. Our suspension system was called a volute spring, and it was rough riding. I mean, when you went along, you were... You were hitting the sides of the tank inside of it, and, and oh, and he, he developed it. The British adopted the Christie system. The Russians adopted it. The Germans adopted it. The French adopted it. Everybody did, and only at the end of the war, the, just a few months before the end of the war, I got five new tanks with the Christie system, and we got five M26 tanks with it. So, so it was almost, the war was almost over before they got around and say, well, Christie got a good idea. Let's, but all the other nations had the Christie suspension system. So they were using American technology against Americans? Oh, yes. Yeah, it was American technology there. And, and of course, they were way ahead of us on the, on the weapons. They had a much higher muzzle velocity. They could penetrate our tanks. We could not penetrate their tank. 
They had smokeless powder, we didn't. When I fired my gun, you could see me all the way to Berlin. When they fired, you had to find out where they were firing from because it, they didn't put out any smoke and flame. Why didn't, do you know why they didn't have the smokeless powder for you guys? I asked Ordinance one time, why don't we have smokeless powder? They said, well, you have to put in a chemical and that'll ruin the gun barrel. I said to them, we had 500 tanks in, in France back there, each with one hole in it with a good gun barrel. So we got 500 gun barrels we could use. Besides, you can't wear out a gun barrel firing a gun. That was a foolish theory that they had, that uh, uh, fatal theory. But that's somebody sitting over here at, in Maryland in Ordnance who's not in the front and firing a gun. So, But it, that was the only reason they gave me. You had to put in a chemical to avoid smoke and flame. And later, uh, they, they put a device on the front of the, of the barrel because when you fired the gun, the tank would roar back and, and it allows the gases to escape as a thing, so you don't have as much blowback and, and recoil. How did they get the name tank? Well, in World War I, uh, in Europe, they it became a stalemate. Uh, they, by then, the machine gun had been invented by the Germans, and Americans had a machine gun invented by Browning. And so in the past, in the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812 and all, you know, they fixed bayonets and they, they marched forward. Well, now you couldn't march forward because there was machine guns that would mow them down, and they had this uh, barbed wire and, and concertina wire out there, which was... And a young British officer saw that the French were using tractors to get around their field. It was called a Holt tractor. It's, uh, it's a caterpillar in the United States, it's the same one. It was a Holt tractor, and they could get around that muddy fields and all that while our troops were in the trenches, in the mud in the trenches. And he got an idea that if you put a shield on one of those tractors, it could cross the trenches, cross the barbed wire, and against the machine guns, and be protected against the machine guns. Put a gun on that, and you had a weapon. It was really not a new idea. The first armored vehicles were chariots, if you stop to think about it, the shield and so on. Anyway, he went to England, and he went from office to office trying to sell it, and finally one, one of the offices uh, agreed, put up the money, and they knew they were going to have to have a lot of steel in there, and they'd have to classify it secret, so they said they were making water tanks for Mesopotamia. Now, Mesopotamia was a desert country, which is now called Iraq, but then it was called Mesopotamia. And that was what they gave. They were making water, steel water tanks for Mesopotamia, and they built it. So in the conversations, the head of the agency would call down and say, how are the tanks coming? And they'd come back, oh, we're working on it, so-and-so, and so and I just got the name of tank. See, when the armored forces were established, the infantry wanted it because that gave them artillery that wasn't horse-drawn. It was right with them all the time as they moved. And the cavalry wanted it. So there was constant fight over the year. And when we were first established, they set us up like infantry divisions. They later changed it completely and, and, and established it in combat command. In the infantry, you have a regiment that's fixed, fixed personnel. In the armored division, you had a combat command. Could be anybody the division commander wanted to put in. Usually he put in a battalion of tanks, a battalion of infantry, a battalion of artillery plus engineers and signal corps and medics and so on. But he could put four battalions of tanks or two battalions in any way he wanted. So were most of your missions joint, uh, were most of your missions joint missions with infantry units? Or were they just? All of our missions, we had 27th Armored Infantry for a while. And then we later had another infantry group with us as we went into Czechoslovakia. But all of our missions was a battalion of tanks, a battalion of infantry, a battalion of artillery. So what were some of the procedures that you had for acquiring a target and eliminating them? Well, uh, sometimes you get fired on. You knew then that, that was a target ready for you. Other times you might spot it. I, uh, I made my thinking like the enemy, where would he be? If he had an anti-tank gun and there's straight road, he'd aim it up the road. If there's a little village there, he'd put it beside the house so that the crew could stay indoors where it was warm and nice, leave one man on the gun. So 
So that's what I'd look for. Or I'd look for uh, camouflage. Uh, so evergreen had been cut and put up there and was turning brown. If I see evergreen trees and here's a spot that's brown, I'd say, well, that's something that they've cut to shield that gun. And, and uh, Did you cook your food on the exhaust system? How did that work? Well, we had, we had canned rations, uh, C rations in a can. And the K rations was in a little box like, you know what Cracker Jack is, uh, like a Cracker Jack coated with wax. And, and so we had the tank and we'd warm, we'd warm them up on the exhaust. The poor infantry, the soldier down there, he had no way. So he'd take that box and light it and try to warm his ration up. And uh, Once in a while, uh, our, we had a wonderful mess crew who tried to get near us as much as possible. And sometimes I'd get word that there was a mess truck had come up and had some hot food. And so I would send back one tank crew at a time because the rest of us were, had to be on the alert all the time. And, and I recall one time they came up, one crew went back, got their food, and the enemy attacked, and the rest of us didn't get any food. But that's part of it, part of the... So what was your role as a tank commander commanding not only your tank, but the other tanks? Well, we had to work with the other tanks. That were, but usually when we get a combat order, they would tell us who was on the right and who was on the left. Throughout the Battle of the Bulge, from December 16th to January 25th, I could never find anybody on my right. I don't know whether they pulled out or weren't there, but uh, so it was it was a bad situation. And you were, you had to spread your tanks so thin, I'd have them 40, 50 yards apart, my own platoon of five tanks, so that they could have marched an army through at night and uh, uh, because they were so widely, they couldn't support each other with fire even, which you, you do. Uh, so it was a bad situation. Uh, what was it like to take fire in the tanks or be in battle with the tanks? Well, you tried to avoid it uh, with the German tanks because they were better than ours. Uh, so what you do when you came up against them, you, you try to maneuver around so that you could get a shot at their rear, where their gasoline tanks were, their diesel tanks or shot at the side to, to disable a track on the tank, one of the tracks. And that would make them immobile. They were, they'd be, uh, on a couple of occasions, when I'd fire smoke around in front of the tank, as near to them, and they thought they were on fire, they'd come out and then we'd machine gun them. But, uh, uh, but you didn't stand and duel with the German tanks. They were better than ours, as far as armor, thicker armor, better. A uh, faster gun could penetrate us. We couldn't penetrate them. And the other thing is they had a lower silhouette. Our American tanks had this high turret so that they could spot you long distance away. They had a low turret, which they could pull up to a, a ridge and have the gun just top of the ridge and not show the rest of the tank. When we pulled up on a ridge and put our gun on top of the ridge, we had this big turret up there which they could spot it. You said that they used an American suspension system, right? Yeah. They had a smoother riding tank. and Yeah. But they had weaknesses in their motor systems. They weren't as good. And they were short of fuel in the Battle of the Bulge. Their hope was to overrun some of our gasoline dumps because they, they, they weren't able to supply their own. They did get one dump. The other ones we burned and set them afire. And these would be an area of a field, but they'd have five gallon cans, jerry cans we call them, of gasoline. There might be a thousand of them in that field, you know. So one place they they broke some of them down and started them on fire, the gasoline on fire, and they burned them up. Uh, Piper, this Colonel Piper, who led the attack in his his panzer unit, his his tank unit, he did he did overrun one fuel dump and get fuel for his tanks, but no more. Only that was the only one. So can you describe some of your missions that you did? Well, in the bulge, it changed every, every hour almost because we, we didn't know how big the battle was at the time. It was a surprise attack. The American forces were very thin and we were in, in there were three German armies attacked. We were in line with the main German attack, the 5th Panzer Army. And so I'd get a mission to stop infantry one time and Next day I was be fighting tanks and 
And one day I was protecting engineers while they put explosives on the bridges so that they could blow a bridge and they couldn't get across a river or stream. And each day was different. And after we had a combat command there, combat command B of the 9th, and then 36 hours later, this, the 7th Armored Division got a combat command into us. So the two, two groups there uh, fought alongside each other, and it was sort of like a mobile defense where you go out to meet the enemy. We did slow them down and, and, and their, their, their route, they were, they were trying to get to, they were trying to attack the main group between the British and the, and the American forces and, and then sue for peace separately. But Roosevelt and Churchill had agreed there would be no separate peace. And their ultimate goal was Antwerp, which was a port where all the supplies and troops, replacement soldiers were coming in, and it was not guarded. So they figured if they get there, they could stop this. The supplies of ammunition and food and, and replacement soldiers. So we were at St. Vith, Belgium, and, and we were surrounded when word came down to me in the middle of the night on the night of the 22nd of December. Was, well, it, was, it was after midnight, so it'd be the 23rd. Uh, that we were going to try to get out. That the 82nd Airborne had been brought up to try to open a road for us. And so the next morning, it, as soon as we could see, in the night the, the ground froze solid, and and we got out on this road. We we, we and uh, managed to get out of the. Although we got fired on by the German troops that were in our rear, had it surrounded. And, we lost some tank getting out there, some troops, but, but, uh. So what were some of the conditions like in the Battle of the Bulge? Obviously it was very cold. The coldest winter in 50 years, they said, very, very cold. Now all the pictures you see show soldiers walking through needing snow. There was no snow the first seven days. It was bitter, bitter cold, uh, but it was no snow. And the night we got out, it happened to freeze up the night, the night before, so it was all right, but. It was, it was just utterly, uh, unbelievably cold. And the ground was tough. The soldiers, foot soldiers had to try to dig foxholes in that tough ground. And, and it was, it was just miserable. You, you got to, and we didn't, the, the infantry didn't have winter clothing yet. They were bringing over troops and, and supplies and they said, oh, <laughs> so they didn't bring any clothing for them. And, but we had our tank outfits, which were little heavier garments and, and, uh, and so, but it was seven days and seven nights we were there in the battle without a break, without hot food, without sleep or anything else. And you'd grab a few minutes of sleep at times. And when I'd be holding an area, I'd, I'd say, keep one up. And that meant all night long, one man had to be on the turret on alert. The others could, could be in their positions inside the tank trying to get some, some sleep. One day I was driving, I was moving up, I was on a road, had my tanks alongside, and I see two trees coming on the side. I thought, what a great fire to put piano wire across there. Well, that would cut your head off with a wire, you know. So I stopped, and about that time, a man, a boy, rose out of a foxhole. He was sat there to guard the, the uh, roadblock. A German boy? It was a boy. He fired a Panzerfaust at me, and that's that's their term for a bazooka. Bazooka, and it skidded off the front. So we we took him out of the uniform right away. He had no more service, but uh, it was it was a uh, uh, roadblock that would either catch you if you drove through it with this wire, or if you didn't, why they had it guarded. But you're supposed to guard roadblocks anyway. And then I got when I got out, I got five new tanks. And they were terrible. They were uh, medium tanks, 32 ton, which had been given to the British under lend lease and they hadn't used them. So they were new. Uh, they had diesel engines, which were a bitch to start because they had a little gasoline engine in there and you had to start the gasoline engine to warm up the diesel and then start the diesel. And worse than that, they had steel tracks, which were utterly useless on that frozen ground. You couldn't, you couldn't handle it. The tank on that frozen ground. And, and so did you go back to the original tanks that you had been using over there? I got another set later, uh, another five tanks. But, uh, in fact, 
after we got out, the, the, we were attached by then. We were attached to everybody in the, during the battle. We were attached to the British at one time. And the, and the higher commander, American commander, wanted us to stay in St. Louis. We have to thank General Montgomery, who was not too liked by the Americans, but General Montgomery said, those tanks in St. Louis won't be worth anything to you if they don't have gasoline and ammunition, and they don't. And so that's how we got out. It was thanks to him. He had, he showed them the foolishness of keeping us in St. Louis and we got out. What was the most significant mission to you? There was no single one. I think the most, uh, one of the most memorable, we, we captured the Ludendorff Bridge at the Rhine and were the first Allied troops to cross the Rhine. I think that was significant in that it was not in our mission. The night before, we were at the town of Stott Meckenheim, and the colonel sent for me, and uh, General Hogue was there, and he said, you know where you are? I said, no, sir, I've run off my maps. He said, we're about 15 miles from the Rhine, and there's a railroad bridge. It may be standing, and I want you to go up there tonight. I said, I can't make it, General. I, I, I don't have enough gas to get there, because we don't like to work at night. Tanks don't like to work at night. And, but he said, you'll leave at 2 100 hours, which is 9 o'clock. Well, my, my crew, my platoon, was pretty uh, dissatisfied, let's say, peed off. Uh, but just before 9, the colonel called me and said, scrub it. And I said, what do you mean? He said, don't go. So they waited till the next morning. And they started the advance. We couldn't get out of town. It was been bombed. It was debris all over the place. So we finally got out. And he wasn't happy with it the lead, so he sent me up to get put in the lead. When I got up there, and I tried to radio him and and I couldn't get him. I told Grimbo, Lieutenant Grimbo was beside me, we had a new tank, a new M26, and he could reach, and so he radioed back, the bridge was standing, and the colonel notified General Hogue that went up the line, but they were career people. They weren't going to change the core, I, headquarters order. The order was for us to get to the Rhine and clear the West Bank of the enemy and go up to the town of Sinsig and the R River and help Patton cross that river up there. But Colonel Ingman, he, he was an Army Reserve officer on duty. Well, he didn't have a career at the time in the Army. He's, and they went out and two explosions went on, one, one on the middle of the bridge and one on the, on the approach to the bridge, which kept us from taking vehicles. And during the night, the engineers covered that hole and in the meantime, the colonel called me and said, there's guns up, there's high hills on both sides, just stiff, like cliffs. He said, the guns are firing down on us. Get up there and stop them. So I took my tanks around. Well, I could, I could have gone up there, but that would have exposed the, going up the hill, the belly of the tank, which is thin. So I had my men dismount, dismount, we went up. They surrendered immediately and we destroyed the guns, put thermite gra grenades which melt steel down the barrels. And then I went back down into town and found a colonel because I couldn't reach him by radio and said that the guns are silenced and won't be firing on you. So that allowed them to cross the Rhine? They were already crossing a right. few at a time. And, uh, but by the time they got the hole covered, it was nearly midnight. Some of the tanks went across. I went across the next morning and 8,000 troops crossed in the first 24 hours. What were some of the other missions that you were involved in? Well, usually they were they were defensive missions to stop a uh, infantry attack, a German infantry or a German tank attack. I recall one in particular. I was sent up to hold a ridge, and I had my tanks up on the ridge, and I could see the enemy infantry, and they were going to overrun us for sure. And so I needed artillery. And rather than go to the company, or the, I went directly back to the battalion commander. Normally, when you called the battalion, it was one of his staff would answer the radio. One of the clerks or one of the intelligence officer or the operations officer. This time, the colonel himself answered. I said, I'm about to be overrun. I need some artillery. He said, I'll see what I can do. And he called me back and said, I can get some for you. So I gave him my location. And then he alerted me. I said, give me one round and I'll adjust the fire. And then he called me back. His name was Gopher and mine was Squirrel. He said, 
Quirrell, this is Gopher. It's on the way. And they, they were ready to fire. And the round was, I was amazed because it, it, it hit a tree just about 50 yards in front of me. So I said, up 100, give me all you can. And so they, they fired and, uh, and devastated that group. They were, by then they were coming across the field. Man, they, they and uh, of course they with, a lot of them withdrew, but there was many of them laying out there. And that night I could hear them groaning and moaning and, and I, I see that their troops were coming out to try to get their wounded. So I called my tanks, don't fire on them. I, I don't know why, I should have, we should have knocked them off too, but they got sentimental for some reason and let them get their wounded off. Did they share that respect for you? No. No. We didn't know about the Malmody Massacre at that time. After that, we didn't, we didn't have any. That's where they killed 88 men in the field, shot them down after they surrendered. So, but uh, it stopped that attack and and I didn't have any more that night, but they would have overrun us for sure. And the tank's very vulnerable because you only got one person who sees anything. If they came up around in back of you, they could, and they could very easily attach a gasoline bomb to your rear or something like that. So they're actually very vulnerable. If you're, if you come upon them in foxholes, if they just stay down their holes, we'd, we'd go over them and, and they, and it wouldn't, but they're, there's a shock action with tanks. It, it, it shocks them. They, they're frightened when they see them. And so, and after the bulge, when we, we would, we were, we were known as a, a charging outfit. So we got a lot of missions after that. And, and we mission would be to get to a river and cross a river or get to a town and so on. And normally the way we'd operate, we would go out in front with our tanks. If it was a village, we wouldn't go into the village. We'd circle to prevent a counterattack and let our infantry come in and clear the village out. Or if it was a forested area, we might, we might fire in there to, to, to harass them and let the infantry go in and clear it out while we went on. And, what does that mean, the charging outfit? Huh? Where did that come from? What? The charging outfit, you said you were called the charging The cavalry outfit. spirit was to get behind the lines if you could and raise havoc. It was made famous during the Civil War when the, when the Confederates were blowing our railroad trains and stealing our horses and taking our supplies. It was the cavalry did it because they could move and the rest were on foot. And it, 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 the cavalry in those days was the elite part of the army with their shiny boots up to here and the spurs and the Sam Brown belt and the saber chain hanging there. And, and uh, the officers carried a swagger stick. And the, so it was the elite army. So they had this pride of, of driving. And so did you feel like that pride carried over to the mechanized units, the armor units? It did in my division because we were we were established at Fort Riley, which out of the Second Cavalry Regiment, and so a number of our people were old-time cavalry, regular Army people, mixed in with our draftees and our our reserve officers who were called to active duty. And for example, when we get a break to stop, my crew would come out and maybe get out what we call the swabber uh, cl to clean the tank gun put this big thing on and lower the tank gun and clean the gun out and check the tracks to be sure they were tight. That's because in the cavalry, they said, uh, when you when you joined the cavalry in the, in the old days, the private, the first day, they sent him down to clean the stables. And above the stable was a sign that said, take care of your horse, we can always get another private. And so they, they would learn how to take care of the horses, so they took care of the tanks. And at night, they, they run a line between a couple of trees and tether the horses. And they, they call that a, a trot line. And my platoon sergeant was an old army sergeant, cavalry sergeant. And he'd say, uh, shall we put out the line tonight? Meaning like you tether the horse, but he meant, should we keep one man up on the tanks all night long? And I'd say, yes, keep one man up. But so they were good. They were cavalry was good soldiers. They were disciplined. And, uh, so how did you go about cleaning the tanks in a combat zone? Well, every now and then you'd get a break. 
You didn't know whether it was going to stop for one day or two days or three days. And the minute you stop, you'd service the tank, you'd tighten the tracks, you'd clean the gun, you'd refill the tanks, and, and generally do maintenance on that and try to get a, a bath or something like that. But you never knew whether you'd be there one day or three days. So you, you, did, you serviced your weapons and cleaned them and, and, and so on. In combat, the, they try to reach you every day with, uh, as often as possible, with the gasoline trucks. And uh, if they could reach you, the gasoline come, and he'd drop off what you wanted at your tank, and go to the other tanks, and then coming back, he'd pick up the empty cans. The, the man driving the ammunition truck would, would ask you what kind of, what, what you needed, high explosive or anti-tank shells or what. And he'd drop that off on the men and would load the tank with them. And sometimes they couldn't get to you, so you were running low. Other times they could service you. And, uh, Did you ever run out of ammunition or gas? Never once. Always they were able to get to us when we needed them. And, and, and uh, but, uh, so that was not a problem. And you have to give them credit because during the bulls they had, they were, sometimes going right through enemy units with their trucks at night and so on. But they'd manage to go back and find where the dump was, where the supplies were, and, and get to us. And a couple of times we were pretty darn low and we'd alert, alert the, the company commander, he'd alert the battalion that we were getting pretty low on gas. That meant they couldn't have, have it going out here and there. You'd have to hold back and, and wait. But, and also, when you got replacements, they were, uh, they would come in, they were, they were nervous, frightened, they didn't know what they were getting into. And so you'd try to work them in. Sometimes I'd let the platoon sergeant handle assignments, because he, he was closer to the men, knew more about them. Sometimes he'd put them in his tank first, then move them to another tank. And, uh, or sometimes we'd get some fellow who had some doubts. We'd put him with the kitchen crew or the mechanics, the, what we call the maintenance crew, the mechanics group, because they were always in the rear of us and would just come up occasionally and let him get a break in there. So, Did you ever meet um, former German soldiers after the war? Oh, yes. In our trips back there, we, we met soldiers. I met, I sat with one who was at the Remagen Bridge. He said he was one of the last ones to get across before we captured the bridge. And he was an amputee, he had one leg off. And, um, so we, we met them. And uh, But the people of Belgium and Luxembourg will never forgive them. They just hate them. On one trip, they said, this is the longest peace we've ever had. And you can't, uh, you can't, uh, you can't show any sympathy for the Germans in those lands. They just hate them. And so How did it make you feel meeting those former German soldiers? What was, what was that like? Well, they were just casual meetings, nothing, nothing, no banquets or no comradeship together. It's just that by chance you'd meet them. Be over there for, uh, well, we got one trip, we were able to get into Berlin. And the Cold War was still on, but, and, uh, and they were so frightened, those people, under Russian domination at uh, East Berlin. Uh, we had a German driver in our charter bus and a German guide, a woman. And as we approached, they stopped. They made us give up our passports and check them out. And they had sniffing dogs to check the vehicle and all that stuff. And, and uh, But when, you, when you'd be in the village, we had a, we had flags a flag on our ship. The people would look the other way. They were just so frightened of the Russians that they were scared to even speak to us, even come up and speak to us. And uh, it was it was it was a, a thing to see. And I can't praise the Belgian and Luxembourgs enough. Though they still remember, they teach their children. They they remember us and join with us when their officials come over here. They go to Arlington and lay a wreath at the at the Battle of the Bulge Memorial, they can, they've never forgotten. Can you talk about the story where the tank driver saved you? Well, one time, as, as I say, when we were in the 
bulge, and it was the seventh day. I got word we were going to pull out, uh, and I was I was in a farmyard. I pulled in the night before, and it was straw and manure and stuff. And I took some branches and laid them over the tank to break the silhouette of the tank, so it wouldn't show against the stars or the moon. And when I got the word, I, I notified the platoon. When I went to pull out in the morning, my tank was frozen in there, and we couldn't move. And I called the platoon sergeant and. and Sergeant Hudson and said, give me a hit, I'm stuck. So he hit me a couple of times. So I got out to lead the group. And just as I got on the road and started down, a gun fired at me, it had been in the rear, an anti-tank gun. So somehow they'd gone through in the night or sometimes set up a gun. And he just missed me. And so I'd say, stop. And Wellesley, who was a wonderful driver, very responsive, he stopped. And the next round went in front of me. And then I said, how long does it take him to load? Well, I didn't know, I guess. And I said, go. He'd go. And the next, the guy fired three times broadside and couldn't hit me. He was a lousy gunner. <laughs> they had a lousy gunner on that one. And, and so, because he was responsive. Another time I got captured, I got a mission to go to a town of Freudsheim. We, the main unit was attacking in this direction, and they sent us to screen the flank, which was to keep the enemy from shooting up beside them. I said, what's in that town? They said, oh, we're holding it. The 89th Recon is holding that town. So I started, I topped the hill, I started down and, and uh, uh, it came out of direct fire. It went right over my head. I immediately knew what it was. He had a gun dug in and he couldn't lower the, the barrel enough to hit me. It, it, it hit the two sergeants tank in back of me. Uh, so I, I, I put fire on the thing and smoke and my friend, uh, Copeland, who had the salt gun platoon, called the battalion and says, I want to fire on them. And they said, no, no, we're holding that. Our troops are holding it. He said, the hell they are. Squirrels coming under fire on it from that town. Well, anyway, I could see some rounds, so he must have been firing too. And then when, it, when I, I told all my people immediately, uh, pull back at once, go back. Don't get off the road. Don't get off the road. And so we held it there till I see all my tanks are back safely. Then I gave him directions to turn around on this narrow road. And I said, now, kicker, let's go, let's go. And so we got out and because he was very responsive in, his, in responding to, because he, he couldn't see, he's down inside, see, he doesn't know. So I'd have to tell him how to left and right tack and turn the tank around and get out. So, so you heard the shell go over your head? It made a throbbing sound. I'd never heard one before, because usually the first thing you know is when they'd explode, but here was one, and, and went over my head and, and hit the platoon. I was down here, and the platoon sergeant was up there, so the round hit his tank and, and uh, killed him. And the platoon in back of me, Trimble, uh, Lieutenant Trimble's tank crew, he pulled off the road and got stuck. Which, and of course, he lost three of his tanks and several men. And uh, and uh, but I wasn't going. I didn't want. I didn't want my people to get stuck in the mud. So that's why I said, withdraw at once. Don't get off the road. Withdraw at once. And, which they did. How did the the road signs and the road systems work when you were in the tank? Road signs? Yeah. Did they? Um, they left them up, which yeah. they shouldn't have done. We'd be over there trying to find our way around, but there were signs still up on various towns. Not not small villages, but some of the major towns would still have a, a sign with an arrow pointing in the direction. And that was one thing they did in the bulge. They they sent the men in dressed in American uniforms. And uh, in our, our uniforms, some of the tanks were marked like our tanks. They had some of our tanks. And they were to raise havoc in, in the rear by changing road signs and doing other things, cutting telephone lines and so on. And, and uh, we one day I had a Belgian come up and tell me, those two people are not Americans. And so I got called the MPs, they took them out. They were apparently German soldiers in American uniforms. Wow. I usually took them out and shot them. Cause that's, that's against the rules of war. That's, uh, they would have their own uniform belief. That, uh, we saw a couple of cases where once I, I captured a peep, they're called jeeps now, 
And those in the armor, we always called them peeps, but they were a jeep. They had been captured by them, and markings changed. They put bigger tires on them, and, and uh, so whatever. The Germans did? The Germans put different oh, tires yeah. on them? Oh, they liked our vehicles. If they could capture them, they put them in action against us. After we crossed the Rhine, I met, uh, we met up with the Russians at the Muldy River, so we figured the war was over. But instead, they reorganized our outfit and sent me down to, from the First Army over to the Third Army under Patton. He wasted no time, sent us into Czechoslovakia. So I ended up at Carlsbad, Czechoslovakia when the war ended. And we were the first to liberate a concentration camp in, the, in combat. And we liberated a couple more after that. But as I say, our tanks didn't go in there. We would circle and let, let the infantry go up to liberate the camp. And, you and, personally saw that, though? You were on those missions of liberation? Oh, yeah. We, we, we saw the camp and in, in the tanks. As I say, we'd go around the thing and, and uh, let the infantry handle it. Somebody in the back of us, uh, military government people or whoever, they want to send up military police. And Leipzig, there were 3,000 guns facing us. And that was, uh, and that area was, was the biggest camp for officers, British officers, American officers. We liberated that, but we didn't go in. We went all around. And so I had no, I had no views. I only saw one, one man standing there. He had a long overcoat and it was warm weather. I spoke, I said something. He opened his overcoat, long overcoat. And that's all he had. That's all the clothes he had. He, so I don't have any personal views of the, of the condition of those people. Did you encounter a lot of friendly locals or villagers? You know, what was that like? They always welcomed you, except the army failed to tell us when we were in Belgium that part of Belgium was once part of Germany. And at the end of World War I, they took part of Germany and put it into Belgium. So they speak two languages there, Flemish and, and uh, can't think of the other one now. Anyway, so they favored the Germans. We didn't realize we were in an area where they were part of Belgium, but they actually favored Germans. They should have alerted us to that. And, uh, that, that. That treaty after World War I screwed up everything. It took two nations and put them together and called them Czechoslovakia. Today they're separated. They never should have been put together. The Slovaks and Slovenes are, are two different groups. They really messed up after World War I. How do you feel about some of the movies that have been you know, portrayed in World War II? The other night I happened to catch the Bridget Remagen again, and I've got that film in my collection. It's the biggest set of lies you ever saw. It's nothing, there's nothing truthful about that at all, that movie. Yet it got a lot of attention, a lot of viewing. People say, oh, I saw the movie, the bridge at Remagen, capturing the bridge, crossing the Rhine. It's just totally false. The fact of the matter is, most of that is, is picturing the German, German soldiers talking, the officers talking, so on and so. Uh, it shows us firing and, and all that stuff. The truth of the matter is, when we left Stadtmeckenheim, we had very little opposition. And our mission was not to capture a bridge. Uh, when we, when we got there, uh, as I say, that, br that bridge had been built in World War I called Ludendorff Bridge after General Ludendorff in World War I. And it had cavities in there for placement of explosives in case they ever had to blow it. Because the Germans always figure, let's plan for the next war now. Let's plan for the next war. That was a German attitude. But the French, when they occupied that, they filled those cavities with concrete. Oh. So the wiring was visible and the explosives were visible. They, they couldn't hide them. And our engineers could see the wires and could see the explosives. That's how they were able to do it. Second, when we advanced, we didn't come under heavy fire there. I was leading the advance. and I, I would occasionally come on some light fire. And I'd send the infantry in and keep on going. And it was a steady move without heavy combat. In that movie, they show firing in cities and towns and buildings. <laughs> there was, there was no, no such thing between Stadtmeckenheim and, and the Rhine River in the town of Remagen. Uh, so it, it's just totally false. and It's dramatized. Now, you understand in some movies, they have to do that to, to 
to entertain the public. Like that finding John, uh, Private Ryan. Well, I, I counted 12 major errors in there, but uh, as I saw it. But the point is, they were they tried to make it enter. First place, they had the, this, this group going out to find him, all clumped together. You don't say clumped together. <laughs> it's too big a target for the enemy. They talk loudly all the time. You don't talk when you're on a patrol. How do you hand signal and so on? So the, and they wore their insignia. Now, when a German sniper goes to shoot somebody, if he sees a corporal and he sees a colonel, he's going to shoot the colonel, not the corporal. So you don't wear your but, but many some units allowed it, and our unit did not. You did, did not wear insignia. Sergeants or officers did not wear their insignia. So, but they had a. They always have a cigar smoking sergeant in those movies. They always have girls and girlfriends and. Uh, this is not true. You don't. <laughs> Do you find that offensive that they falsify a lot of those facts? They're in the entertainment business, so that they've got to entertain and not. Uh, I, I don't like it because they falsify history. That's wrong. But history is not being taught in our schools anyway. The schools, that's a great way. In, in this county, we had at one time 76 public schools, only one recognized Veterans Day. Kennedy High School senior class used to call me each year, and I'd go there for an assembly and talk to them. And then later I took John Bowen and his wife, both neither were World War veterans, but they were Army veterans, but never in combat. And I took them over because he's an authority at, uh, on history and uh, goes to the archives one day a week. and. Uh, archives too over in College Park. So, but that would, and I think they've stopped it now, but I think that, and I've talked to students in the history classes in the high school and, and in college, they'll say, well, we didn't touch anything on the World War II, or we had, we had half hour on that, you know. I mean, do you wish they would, do you wish they would spend a lot more time teaching them the history of World War II? At least an hour or two. Battle of the Bulge was the largest battle ever engaged in by the American Army. 81,000 casualties in that between December 20, December 16th and January 25th, about five weeks. 81,000 casualties, 19,000 killed. 19,000, and they don't even touch on it. I think they should know that. Uh, what else do you want the future generations to know or know better about the war? Well, it, it's, it's, it's hard to say. Those of us in that war, we'd like to have them know more about it, but not for personal gain, it's, but to, to let them know that what, what America went through and the, and the fact that we were the ultimate aim of Hitler. There's no question about that. He would have, he would have hit us next, and and uh, America responded. And I I don't think we should have a long course on it, but uh, at least they should have. Some maybe an hour or two or half a day on World War II. Uh, they don't touch on the Pacific at all. Pacific War got the short end of the ship because Roosevelt and and, uh, and uh, they decided Churchill and Roosevelt decided we'll concentrate on Europe and let the Pacific wait till we get through with Europe. And of course, they didn't agree on everything. They sent troops to. to uh, Africa first, invaded Africa, which is where we sent some lousy tanks in there. And you know what the Germans call them? Ronsons. You know, you know Zippo lighters? Every time they hit an American tank, it blew up in flames because they had the ammunition around the turret on the sides of the crew. They later put uh, water jackets around it and then later moved them down below. But... Uh, uh, so they, then when they went and made the continent, there was questions about whether they should go into France or into Italy and, and, and down the southern end, which they, that won out. And we, we fought a terrible battle in, in Italy, a lot of losses and a lot of poor commanders there. Even the Battle of the Bulls brought up some poor commanders who weren't really with it, should never have been in a combat situation, generals. My commanding general, Leonard, and General Eisenhower were in the same class at 1905 at West Point, so maybe that's why they used us so much. <laughs> so what was it like to experience some of the combat losses? Well, of course, 
you're devastated at the moment, but when one of your tanks get hit and, and you've got losses, uh, you can't stop right then. You've got, first you've got to silence the guns that got them, or they're going to get you next and your other tank. So you can't immediately react, but you do as soon as you can. And you try to get the medics to come up and, and evacuate the, the wounded. And in the bulge, we didn't have that opportunity because, it was, as I say, it was a mixed-up war. And later, I think it was late, early February, I believe, I can't remember the exact date, but P Lieutenant Fisher, Paul Fisher, had another platoon in my company. And he and I went back to the area, and he had a great memory for geography, a, a photographic memory. And so we found one of my tanks, and it were still two bodies in the turret, two in, up in the turret, frozen yet, but beginning to thaw. And they had on their dog tags. And we found nearby a graves registration unit. That's the unit that comes in and finds, identifies bodies and gets taken care of. And uh, they, they were clearing out the Hurtgen Forest, which was a terrible loss of infantry in that Hurtgen Forest. And I told them where the tank was located, the names of the men, the dog tank. I said, you better get up there because they're thawing. And so uh, those are the kind of things that, that, that affect you, but you can't, you, you can't, can't let it affect you too much because it would transmit it to the men. You've got, a, you've got a job to do, so you, you hold up and do what you can. And, what were some of the things that you did to keep the morale high? Well, you don't commiserate, you don't cry or anything. One thing, one time when we were in combat, I got out of my tank, took my steel helmet, and got on the back of the tank, put some water in, I started shaving. And I could just imagine my tank commander down the line, look at that dumbass lieutenant out there shaving, you know. So it was just an act. Because one of the first things, one of the first days when I was in combat, I saw a young lieutenant and his troops were all in foxholes, and he went, I said, where's your hole? He said, I can't be a leader down in a hole. I can't be, lead them in a hole. And that stayed with me that you, you've got to be evident uh, to, be the, to be the leader and show. And lots of times you will have information that I wouldn't pass on to them because uh, I knew it would, would, would uh, harm their morale or threaten their morale. And this is true at all the levels. Many of the times our high command knew about some operation of the enemy, but they didn't dare prepare for it because the enemy would know that we knew their code. We were, we, we, so they were knowing there was going to be some losses. And they just stayed silent and, and because, uh, and we did have their code. We didn't down at our level, but higher command did. So sometimes you, you have some news. I didn't tell them at St. Vith that we were surrounded, but I knew it. Well, then we, you, you had a morale problem. And, uh, so what do you think some of the qualities of a good leader are? What do you think it takes to be a leader? Well, you've got to be one of them, just a soldier alongside of them and not a commander that's giving commands. And when you go to move out, you've got to take the lead, not send somebody out ahead of you. And things like that, that they, they come to respect you. You don't realize it at the time because there is a separation between the enlisted and the commissioned officers and in lodging and housing and stuff like that. There's different, but, uh, when we, years later, we, we, we weren't having reunions, so we organized one, started having reunions. And only then did I learn how, how much my men had respected me that they, they said we, we the men of my platoon that were still living. That's when I, I felt good that it was, it was working well. And, and I recall several years later, I got a call and my uh, driver, Ray Wellesley, the woman said, I'm Ray's wife. So said, she said, Ray died last night. And the last thing he says, tell the lieutenant I love him. So I just felt so good that, uh, that he had that feeling that he still remembered that we were together as fellow soldiers and not as a commander and a driver. So.